Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining our, our webinar today. My name is Karen Frawley. I'm a tax partner with Deloitte and head of our markets team. It's a pleasure to be hosting today's session. And as you can see on screen, we'll be joined today by a number of guests. Um, the first being Dr. Kieran McQuinn, research professor at the ESRI, along with my colleagues, Mike Ennis, an analytics director in our consulting practice, and Deloitte CEO, Harry Goddard. But before we jump to our speakers, I do want to mention that today's webinar is being recorded. So we'll be able to share the link with you after the event is complete, and we'll welcome you to revisit the content yourself or equally to share it with others. We also invite your, co your comments and questions. You'll notice at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A chat box. And if you think there's a, a question for, that you have for speakers at any point, just type it there. I'll hold it for discussion and towards the end of the event, we will have a Q&A session and we'll try to get as many of your, to as many of your questions as possible. So our first speaker today is Dr. Kieran McQuinn, who recently authored the EOSSRI's quarterly economic commentary. The report very much focused on the impact of COVID-19. But Kieran, I think as you go through um, your comments, I'm sure you'll agree that things have very much progressed significantly, even in the short window since that report was published on the 19th of March. Yes, thank you very much, Karen, and thank you very much for the uh, invitation to present here at the uh, at the webinar this afternoon. Um, so this is uh, what I'm going to present uh, are the results essentially of our quarterly economic commentary. But as Karen has said, the, even though we only published it a, a few weeks back. Clearly, events have moved on in the meantime, and, and the, I suppose the severity of the downturn has, has uh, been accentuated. So uh, my comments will obviously reflect that in terms, of, uh, in terms of the analysis. So just to give you a broad overview initially of, of what I'm going to talk about, in terms of our commentary, those of you who aren't familiar with our economic commentary, we obviously produce it four times a year. And typically what we do when we do a commentary is we do a for, what we call a forecast for the present year and for next year. So we'll do a forecast of how we see the economy moving in 2020 and in 2021. This commentary, however, our first of the year, was rather different uh, given the nature and the scale of the disruption that the COVID-19 is, is likely to have on the economy. So instead of doing a forecast, just a small technical point, we, we did what was called a scenario analysis. And the scenario analysis reflects the fact that there was huge, obviously, a huge uncertainty around COVID-19, around its, the, the duration, the length of time that uh, an administrative closure, as we refer to the kind of the lockdown measures that were taken, was put in place, and a uh, huge uncertainty, obviously, around when those measures are likely to be relaxed. And so as a result, we have to make some fairly strong assumptions in terms of our analysis, and hence we call it a scenario as opposed to a forecast. Anyway, so what we also did is we basically just for, uh, focused on 2020. We didn't result, uh, present any results for 2021. I think our feeling was that if we managed to capture the severity and the true scale of the downturn in 2020, we'd be doing quite well. And in our next analysis, which will come out probably in May, uh, we will uh, you know, obviously focus on the present year, but we'll also present results for 2021. So in order to capture the impact of COVID-19 on the Irish economy, we essentially conducted a demand side analysis. And essentially what we did is we particularly focused on the implications of the administrative close down. And by that, I mean the measures that have been taken where schools have been closed, shops have been closed, commercial enterprises generally put into lockdown over a specific period of time. And so we took, um, uh, as I'll explain in detail in a minute, we took a 12-week period where we assumed that the lockdown would uh, be in existence for. Uh, and then we make certain assumptions going forward after that in terms of how the economy will recover. Uh, and then we present our, our results for the year as a result. So essentially, we, we spent quite a bit of time focusing on the implications of the administrative closure uh, on both the consumption and investment channels, two major channels of growth in the economy, uh, and then we also work through the uh, related assumptions on the traded sector. Uh, and finally, we examine the implications for the labor market and the public finances. And, and again, I suppose just to, to reiterate the point that, as I said, even though the, the, uh, the, the results were published just two weeks ago, uh, events have moved on, and even some of the numbers that have come out in the last 24 hours, I suppose, have highlighted uh, the true scale of, uh, of the impact of, of COVID-19, particularly on the labor market. 
So first of all, just to present our, our overall results um, uh, in terms of our overall assessment of how uh, COVID-19 would impact the economy. And you can see in that in the table that I've put up there, I have the results, the growth rates uh, for the major kind of channels of growth in the Irish economy in 2019. So these are essentially the actual uh, rates of growth. Uh, and in 2020, then, the results of our scenario analysis, so how we see the individual components of growth and growth overall being impacted uh, under our 12-week scenario. So you can see, I mean, the Irish economy, obviously, over the last five or six years has been performing very, very strongly, and last year was no different, uh, with growth rates in and around 5.5%, um, you know, underlying growth rates, essentially, when we strip out some of the multinational-related activity. Um, so the, the one, I suppose, positive feature, if you like, is that the economy was going into this crisis into this uh, severe downturn in a very, very strong position. And even when we started to look at the numbers for the domestic economy in January and February, it seemed that the economy was experiencing some kind of a, even a, a stronger pickup at the start of the year than what we would have expected. And this may have been due to some of the, um, if you like, uncertainty about Brexit being alleviated at the end of 2019 when you had the withdrawal agreement formally uh, being, being pushed through. This did seem to have somewhat of a bounce for the domestic economy, and as I said, particularly when we looked at some of the initial data for January and February, particularly the tax returns, the labour market uh, uh, details, and consumer confidence, it seemed that the domestic economy uh, looked set to have another very strong year uh, in the present year. However, obviously, that all, all of that changed very, very swiftly and suddenly. So you can see in terms of the, the column there under 2020, you can see the summary of our results for uh, consumption, um, we expect it to decline, private consumption declining by around 4% for the year. Uh, public consumption, that reflects, the, the increase in that reflects the fact that obviously the government have put in place a number of measures uh, to, to deal with COVID-19, and indeed those measures may be increased as the year progresses. Investment, uh, overall investment down very strongly uh, in 2020, and I'll, I'll go through uh, briefly the reasons for the, the different, uh, the reductions in the different components. Uh, trade, both exports and imports down. So overall, our feeling is that growth would fall by around 7% under the scenario that we, that we look at. Uh, in terms of the employment consequences, obviously very, very severe. Um, if you look at the unemployment levels, and these are annualized for the year, I'll go through the kind of the more timely variations through the year. But overall, we're saying that the unemployment levels could be up to around 310,000, with an unemployment rate for the year on average uh, at around 12.5%. And, um, you know, obviously the, the overall annual uh, picture will be very much influenced by the pace of the recovery. Finally, then, at the bottom of the slide, you'll see the estimates for the public finances. So we're suggesting that last year um, the, the public finances registered a surplus for the first time in some time, um, a mild surplus of just under half a percent. However, if you look at our outlook for the present year, we're saying that the deficit would probably be around 4.5%, and that would be somewhere in the region of $13 billion in, in, in monetary terms. However, that figure is, is almost certainly likely to be greater as, as the year progresses. The central bank, for instance, brought out their analysis last Friday. They suggested that the monetary amount could be somewhere in the region of 30 billion in terms of the uh, in terms of the deficit, and that would result in a in a, a debt to G or in a, the general government balance as a percentage of GDP being somewhere in the region of around nine percent minus nine percent. So these figures are disimproving almost on a weekly basis. But um, that's, that, that's where we, we see the position uh, in terms of the analysis we did. So in terms of just going into the details, and in particular just to focus on consumption, because this is obviously one of the major channels through which the economy is going to be adversely impacted, what we did and what a number of, of have, uh, other commentators have been doing is we took the analysis of uh, a number of UK-based economists back in 2010, Kiel Brown et al., um, there was a number of people involved in the study, including Simon Ren Lewis, who many of you will be uh, undoubtedly familiar with, a very well-known British uh, academic economist, but also a, an economic commentator. And they examined the impact of a pandemic in the UK. And essentially what they did was they took detailed micro-level data at the household, uh, on the household basis, and they, if you like, examined the different components of the, uh, the consumption uh, and they, um, on the basis of the different elements and the different components, they then, for over a 12-week period, 
if you like, they reduced down or changed those different elements on a significant basis um, depending on the item. Uh, and so we basically followed pretty much the same pattern. So we basically took household budget information, uh, the latest household budget survey information, and what we did was we assumed that, as I said, we'd have a 12-week administrative closure. Uh, and for that 12 weeks then, we looked at the various different components of household consumption, and depending on the item, we made significant changes to it. So for instance, if we go forward to the next slide, which Apologies, it's, uh, uh, the, the, the font is quite small. But if you look, you can see we have three different columns there. We have the normal week, so that is the typical expenditure by a household on these various different components in a, what we call a normal week. So this is on average, if you like, throughout the year for the economy. And then we have our two specific assumptions, if you like, in terms of, in terms of the scenario analysis. So one is the pandemic week. So that's over the 12-week period what would happen to that individual element of consumption uh, uh, during the 12-week pandemic. So you can see that, for instance, certain elements such as meals away from home, uh, clothing and footwear, household durable goods, um, vehicle maintenance, uh, bus, Lewis, rail and taxi, etc. all of those items of consumption fall away to zero over the 12-week period. Okay, so that, again, that reflects the nature of the administrative close down. Uh, and the fact that obviously this expenditure, right, the expenditure on these individual items is going to, to fall away significantly, and in our case, we've taken zero uh, for, the, for the pandemic period, the 12-week period. Um, other items actually register an increase. So obviously, uh, uh, meals and, and general food that's consumed at home, for instance, if you look at the top row, you can see that on average, uh, the Irish household would consume around 97 euros worth of goods on a normal basis. Uh, during the pandemic, we actually assume that that's uh, over doubled. So there's more than a doubling of the total food that's consumed at home uh, during the pandemic period. So that's for the pandemic period. Um, and then we have the recovery uh, phase. So the recovery phase, i just go back a slide. Uh, the recovery phase uh, we have to make certain assumptions uh, about what happens after the 12-week pandemic. So what happens to consumption of the various different elements uh, in the 12-week period after uh, which the, the kind of administrative closure has been relaxed? And again, the, the nature of the analysis, it, it has to be said, is quite arbitrary in terms of what we assume. But we obviously assume that certain elements will rebound strongly. Other elements will stay pretty much the same. Um, but so, some items uh, uh, are likely to have a very strong recovery in, in the 12-week period, for instance, after uh, the, the pandemic. And so if we go back to the table, um, the, the detailed uh, table, you can see, for instance, <clears throat> um, for something like drink consumed out, which was running at our own, which was experiencing zero uh, expenditure during the pandemic period, that comes back up to normal in the 12-week period uh, after. Um, and we have a number of items um, which come back up to their normal level of consumption that they would have experienced on an, on an average basis. But then we have some items that actually uh, come back even stronger than what they would be on, uh, on a normal basis. So, for example, uh, if we look at vehicle consumption, that comes back quite strongly. Um, uh, issues around bus, Lewis, and, and rail, that, that comes back on a normal basis. But other elements, total miscellaneous goods, services, they come back quite strongly as well. So depending on the item, some of these items come back stronger, uh, more strongly uh, than what, what other items do. So overall, then, what we feel is that as a result of the scenario, as a result of the pandemic, during the pandemic period, household consumption is 25% lower uh, during this period uh, than what it would be on a normal basis. However, in the recovery period after the pandemic, consumption is 9% above normal. So there is quite a rebound, if you like, uh, depending on the items in the period after the pandemic, okay? Overall, uh, when we net those effects out, what it means, and you can see it in the table there in terms of the percentage change, is that consumption is around minus 4% uh, for the year as a whole. Now, that minus 4% does assume uh, quite a recovery in the 12-week period after the pandemic, Whereas uh, if you don't have a recovery, then consumption will be down by 6% over the period uh, for the year as a whole. 
So that, that's consumption. Investment, again, it's a, it's a fairly similar type of exercise. So it's almost, if you like, a kind of an accounting style exercise where you're simply going in, looking at the various different components of investment in a similar way that we did to, uh, to consumption. And you're identifying elements that you think would uh, experience a sharp fall off during this pandemic period. So for example, dwellings and improvements, uh, we have investment falling to zero for that category uh, during the pandemic. Similarly, for other building and construction, machinery and equipment, we have quite a significant fall off in investment during those periods, anything up to 50% fall off during the pandemic period. And then, similar to the consumption, we make assumptions about the recovery period and the 12 week uh, period after that. So, we have, you know, depending on the item, we have a certain rebound, what we call a rebound, so that investment would come back up to 80% of what it normally would be in the 12 week period after the administrative close down. Um, and so then when we, again, similar to the, um, similar to the consumption uh, situation, when we, um, if you like, average that out over the entire year, we actually uh, get quite a bit of um, a fall off in investment. So we get investment down by around 8% over the year. And some people have been quite, you know, noted that result that the investment effect seemed to be greater than the consumption effect. Uh, and I suppose that reflects the fact that on the consumption side, you do have quite a bit of uh, at home consumption, which tends to kind of ameliorate the overall consumption effect. Uh, on the moving just on to trade, obviously the trade is very hard to gauge because, um, it, it, you know, Ireland being a small open economy, trade is a hugely important channel of growth for the Irish economy. Um, and so therefore, when you have a significant downturn in international trade, that will compound the domestic nature of the shock. So clearly investment and, and consumption being the domestic sources of the shock, um, but obviously trade is also going to experience quite a significant fall off, both in terms of exports and imports. Uh, now, again, the nature of the shock as far as exports are concerned very much depends on the sector. So, um, for instance, sectors like machinery and equipment, business services, tourism, obviously, are going to be particularly impacted, uh, especially during the uh, administrative closure period. Other types of exports, medicinal, pharmaceutical products, likely to be less impacted. So, we, we again, we tailor or modify down all of those various different components um, depending on the, the, the actual sector uh, involved. And so overall, then, our trade is down by around 5% on the export side and down just over 3.5% on the imports. Um, on the labor market, again, this is something which has been changing almost on a day-to-day on a, on a or even uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So when we came out with our analysis, initially, I think there were certain eyebrows raised about the scale of the unemployment shock. So, for example, we went in, looked at the various different sectors, the wholesale and retail, accommodation and food service, transport and distribution being the, the three major sectors which were most likely uh, to, to be impacted. Those cumulatively employed somewhere in the region of 590,000 people in the first quarter of the year. Um, and we, you know, on the basis of the close down or, or, or the closure, we essentially had, you know, the vast majority of people in those sectors being made unemployed uh, uh, for, for, uh, for the, 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 the 12, over the 12 week period. So that essentially resulted in an addition to the unemployment numbers of approximately uh, 340,000 people losing their jobs at the peak and, and the peak obviously being in Q2 of the year. Unemployment, as a result, went up to 18%. And then we have, uh, you know, as the economy recovers through the latter uh, quarters of the year, we have unemployment coming down to 10.7%. If we look, those were our, essentially our, our, uh, our results under the, under the scenario. But if you look at the live register uh, figures, you can see that, uh, which were released at the tail end of last year, or last week rather, you can see that there's now around 513,000 people on the live register uh, uh, who are availing of COVID-related payments, um, and that's up obviously substantially on the February uh, number. In terms of the overall payments, it seems that just under 10% of the COVID-related payments were from the wage subsidy scheme, uh, and 90% of those were from the COVID unemployment benefit. And I can talk a little bit about that in a minute, but 
The fact that the, a relatively small percentage is coming through the wage subsidy scheme is a bit disappointing because clearly the more people are retained by employers, and that's obviously a condition of the wage subsidy scheme, then you know, presumably the quicker and the stronger the rebound and the recovery uh, uh, once the administrative uh, closure measures have been, uh, have been eased. And so that was something which uh, you, you know, we noted in terms of the, the, the detailed figures that came out of. Just a, an interesting chart just to look at the, the scale of the unemployment shock uh, if you compare it uh, on a historical basis, so this is Irish unemployment data from 1973 on a monthly basis up to the present. So you can see I've highlighted the two periods previously where we had very high rates of unemployment. So essentially the late, the late 1970s and through the early 80s, and then in the period just after the financial crisis after 2008-2009. Uh, and the reason I put the two bars is to show the kind of from the peak or from the trough up to the peak of the unemployment in both cases. And you can see that, you know, it took around 21 quarters at the end of the 1980s to go from an unemployment rate of around 8% up to 16%. Similarly, after the financial crisis, it took around 12 quarters to go from 5% up to 16%. Whereas if you look at the very end of the graph, you can see the huge jump in the unemployment figures literally overnight. Um, so going from 4.8% in February to our assumed 18%, but in reality, uh, that's now likely to be uh, in excess of 20% on the basis of the most recent data. Public finances, again, this is another category which will experience significant uh, is likely to experience significant change as we as we move through the year. So our overall assessment uh, two weeks ago was that the deficit would be around four four and a half percent, and a monetary amount of around 12, uh, 13 billion. That reflects obviously the increase in public expenditure, which is approximately eight billion to date in terms of addressing issues around uh, issues around transfer payments, income protection, the health exp health expenditure. Um, what's, those are relatively easy to forecast because essentially they're outlined by the government. What's less easy is the decline in, in revenues. So all of the major tax headings you can, experience, you can expect to experience a substantial fall off. Income tax, VAT, even corporation tax is likely to register a fall off. And we had those kind of assumptions built into our overall analysis. As I said, the central bank last Friday suggested a deficit of 6% and possibly up to 9% uh, for the present year, uh, again, just depending, I suppose, on, on the length of, of how long the administrative closures remain in place and the strength or otherwise of the recovery in the latter two quarters of the year. So just moving on finally now to the policy response in terms of how we see it and, and the measures that have been taken. So obviously uh, quite a substantial measure, number of measures have already been announced. A fiscal package of over $8 billion, including the wage subsidy scheme, enhanced illness benefit and unemployment payments. The central bank, uh, you know, made changes to their counter-cyclical capital buffer. Uh, the private banking sector has brought in measures such as the mortgage payment moratorium. Overall, I think our feeling is that the initial response, uh, particularly during the administrative close down, needs to be a targeted one, so directed at households and firms that are most uh, impacted, uh, and it measures you know, need to be implemented which will support incomes and try and keep as many of the distressed enterprises alive during this period. Um, however, once the administrative closure is over, there may well be need for a broad-based stimulus, uh, which would essentially try and reignite or re-stimulate uh, economic activity. One area where this could be considered uh, is possibly in the house building uh, area. You know, we were at the outset of the year when we were pre uh, preparing our, initially, our initial comments in the commentary, we were going to talk about the dangers of overheating uh, if a substantial increase in housing activity took place. Uh, however, obviously, there's now no such fears of overheating, and so there may well be the space, if you like, for a substantial uh, uh, house building program, particularly given, if you think back to the results of the election, where this, this obviously was a major, a major issue. Um, the second part of our policy response is at the European level, and again, we stress this quite significantly in the commentary. This is hugely important, and I think Europe really has to step up to the mark in this case. There have been a number of measures introduced by both the Commission and the European Central Bank, and particularly the, the bank has um, it brought back in some of it or increased its uh, quantitative easing program with 750 billion uh, in addition to, to previously committed funds. 
However, I think it's evident that notwithstanding this, this contribution so far, there is need for more um, from the European institutions. Uh, there's already been uh, moves, including our own Taoiseach was one of nine heads of state requesting the introduction of euro bonds. There's been other commentary about, for instance, the need to grant the European Stability Mechanism a banking license, and the ECB then provide it with funding. And this measure in particular uh, would be introduced to offset the possibility of a sovereign debt crisis. There's going to be huge pressure on the public finances across Europe. There's absolutely no doubt about that in response to this crisis. And I think Europe has to play an initial role in stabilizing debt markets and ensuring that we don't have a sovereign debt crisis on top of everything else. But additionally, I think, given the growth problems that have been prevalent in Europe over the last seven or eight years, I think it's important uh, that the increase in debt that will occur um, is not likely to impact the growth prospects of Europe going forward. Finally, um, just to highlight, obviously in the SRI we're going to be doing a lot of work on COVID-19. We are doing a lot of work on it. We'll have more um, formal kind of analysis of the impacts of COVID-19 on the economy in terms of some of the macroeconomic models that we have. We've been participating significantly on, on the health front in terms of doing a lot of health modeling for the department and the HSC. Um, and we're also engaged in a substantial amount of work for the Department of Housing, looking at some of the housing issues that are coming up as a result of this in terms of affordability issues. Uh, and indeed, we are also engaged in some work in looking at uh, SMEs and the performance of SMEs and access to finance. Um, so with that, I, I hope that that gave you a, a flavor of our overall assessment. As I said, um, it's one that is you know, literally changing by the day. Uh, but clearly, um, we will be coming back to the issue on a regular basis in the, the coming weeks uh, and months ahead. Excellent. Thanks, Kieran. I can see a number of questions popping in already, and many with similar subjects, so might hold these to the end. But obviously, sure. if, if anything else occurs to anyone, um, by all means, pop them through on the, the Q&A function. So at Deloitte, we've formulated a lot of our work on the COVID-19 challenges both internally and with clients around three time frames. The respond phase, which is I think where, where we are now, but hopefully beginning to come out of. The recover phase, and where we all ultimately want to get to, to the try phase. And as part of the respond phase, our analytics team has looked at the relevant market, market data. So I'll now bring in Mike Ennis, a director in our analytics practice, to share some work our analytics team have been doing around the trends in the Irish market. So with that, Mike, I'll hand over to you. Great. Thanks, Karen, and good afternoon, everybody. So as this uh, COVID-19 scenario developed over the last couple of weeks, within the analytics practice, we wanted to try and understand what the performance of COVID-19 might mean for the economy, um, our population, and what it might mean for our health practices. Um, we've been looking at multiple sources of data and statistics over the last couple of weeks, and similar to what Kieran said, this is very much a, a rolling forecast on what we're seeing. And I wanted just to share with you a couple of things that I thought would be of interest and uh, value to, to people on the call. So we looked at a couple of different things, um, incidence predictions, reinfection rates, uh, current trends, and market impacts. So I wanted to go through these in a little bit of detail and give you some, hopefully, some interesting pieces of information. Um, the first thing we looked at was um, incidence predictions, and really what we want to try and do is to understand when might we actually see the peak of COVID-19. And what we did was we, we built a prediction model to, to essentially try and forecast the number of cases that would emerge in the future, again, to try and get some grip on when we thought the, the, the pandemic might peak in this country. Um, and we're using historical data from the Department of Health. Uh, obviously, there's a lag between uh, the data we have, and you might see the, the nightly announcements from uh, Tony Hoolan on the news. Uh, but essentially what we're seeing is that the, the actual volume of new cases emerging is, is lower than that we would have predicted, which is good. Um, it, it, it would indicate that the, the social isolation measures, social distancing, the restrictions around mobility, et cetera, are starting to have an impact and a positive impact in the number of incidents and the, the rise in the number of cases. So that, that is, a, is a welcome trend that we've, we've noticed. Um, the second one is one of the key kind of pillars of the government's response strategy, and that is really around reinfection rates. So 
uh, as Kieran mentioned, the the isolation, distancing, and the economic shutdown um, really are to try and control reinfection rates. So simply, what that means is how many people could be infected by another infected person. Um, and the simulations that we've done, again using uh, using data from the Department of Health and other um, sources that we have, would indicate that we are now down to approximately 2.1. And what that means is that one infected person has the potential to infect 2.1 other people. Um, and that's actually also a good uh, metric. That is down from around 10 at the start of the pandemic. Um, and just to put that into perspective, um, Wuhan in China is now down at one or less. So that statistic, again, would lead us to believe that the distancing measures and the isolation and the economic shutdown, albeit having a detrimental effect on the economy, is actually managing to reduce or flatten the curve, as we've heard um, the, the HSE talk about. Um, and that is that is certainly a very positive um, development in terms of controlling the pandemic, uh, isolating those clusters of the population that um, are infected, removing them uh, and getting them treated, getting them tested, um, but also ensuring that we are managing the, the flow of traffic through to our um, healthcare practitioners. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Uh, one of the other things we wanted to try and look at is some current trends. And really what we want to try to get a sense of is how are people coping? Uh, with this very unprecedented time, um, notwithstanding that many of us are working from home, have kids at home and are trying to manage uh, elderly parents and neighbours and friends, etc. We want to try to get a sense of what does it mean on the ground? What are people doing? What are they thinking about? Uh, so really understand consumer behaviours and demand in a little bit more detail. Um, so we trawled through some Google search uh, criteria and came up with a view on what's trending and what's not. Um, so some of these will be of no surprise to you. So grocery delivery services, whether it's Tesco or SuperValue or your Deliveroo, uh, have seen exponential growth in terms of searches as people try and cope with uh, getting food delivered uh, to their homes uh, in the event of all the businesses being closed around restaurants, etc., retail services. Uh, conversely, air travel is down 50%. Uh, in terms of search volume, uh, very little air travel happening at the moment, if any. Uh, most of that relating to the uh, transport of cargo, uh, food and supplies, medical supplies, etc. Um, interesting enough, we are spending more time searching for either home office or gym equipment as we're all trying to figure out how we work more effectively at home and uh, exercise at home. So we see a sharp increase in uh, those two things. Um, unsurprisingly, medical supplies have seen a dramatic increase. So you can imagine the the searches uh, for sanitizers, gloves, masks, other PPE equipment has, has seen a sharp increase. Um, and also one of the, unfortunately, the more disturbing uh, trends that we've seen is, is people uh, reaching out uh, much more to search for uh, mental health services. And this includes uh, domestic abuse and also child abuse. So that is a very, unfortunately, a very unwelcome uh, development in terms of how people are coping and managing, but not unsurprising considering these are, are certainly unprecedented times of how the population is being um, isolated and shut down from, from normal activities around sport, etc. Um, the last thing we looked at is uh, effectively the market impact. And, and Kieran touched on some of this, but what we wanted to do is we wanted to um, analyze a number of the markets across the globe uh, and understand where does COVID-19 or how does COVID-19 compare with other uh, global uh, economic uh, and healthcare shocks. Um, so we looked at a number of different markets from the S&P to the FTSE 100 to the Hang Seng to the ISEC and a number of other uh, global markets uh, and we compared them to a number of different crises over the last uh, number of years and we wanted to take a a health issue, so we picked um, SARS. We wanted to look at an uh, economic scenario, so we looked at the 2008 uh, financial crash. And then we also wanted to look at um, a terrorist event, 9-11 uh, being, being certainly the, the, the most significant. So within those three uh, comparisons, we, we looked at 
how does COVID-19 from a market perspective, how does that compare to the market shock that we've seen across those three? Um, so at the moment, the and again, this is this is very much a, a rolling forecast, but what we're seeing is the the major indices are down by somewhere between 20 and 30 percent, depending on the day and depending on what, what market you look at. Um, how do they compare uh, closely to uh, 9-11, which saw a 15 to 25 percent reduction in the overall markets? And again, similar to, to SARS, we, we are seeing a slightly deeper um, decline uh, in terms of performance around the markets. Uh, but cer certainly and thankfully, it doesn't compare to the Great Recession, where we would have seen up to a 70% decline in markets um, during that period. Um, interestingly, not all the stocks are performing poorly. So um, some of the stocks that are performing well are, as you'd imagine, in the, the healthcare space, uh, in the food distribution space, in the packaging um, space, but there, there are a couple I thought I would just call out uh, as, as of interest. Um, the first is Amazon. So unsurprisingly, as we are all getting used to um, spending more time at home uh, and living in a virtual world, um, Amazon has seen a sharp increase in its stock price. Um, lots of investors seeing as Amazon will, will increase its, its revenue share as we spend more time ordering and getting uh, goods and services delivered. Um, another one that I thought was of interest is a business called uh, Zoom Video Communications. Um, and again, with our, our new virtual working environment, we're all getting used to having calls and video conferences um, at home through applications like Skype or Microsoft Teams. And a relatively new uh, player in that space is um, Zoom. Uh, regrettably, a number of investors um, Earlier on, the market invested in a different business called Zoom Technologies, which in fact is, a, is an Indian-based uh, online training uh, business and not related to uh, Zoom video communications at all. So they, they saw an initial bump in their, their stock price, but that quickly evaporated. Uh, but certainly, um, Zoom have seen uh, an increase in their uh, performance over the last number of weeks. Um, one other that, that I thought is of interest is a pharmaceutical business called Regeneron, based in Limerick, um, and they have, uh, if you were to listen to some of the markets, they would uh, appear to be developing a COVID-19 vaccine, uh, and they are looking at a 52-week high in terms of their stock price based on uh, the potential to develop that um, vaccine in the near future, which would be certainly welcome indeed. Um, the last piece of insight that I thought I'd share is just in relation to a, a comment that Kieran also made. Um, we're all getting used to virtual working, um, and I think what you're going to see is over the next three to six months is lots of organizations uh, reconsidering how they can deliver more effective services through a virtual workforce. So certainly a move to digital operations, self-serve, I think a transition to cloud. One of the other things that I think you may see is lots of organizations um, reconsidering their real estate footprint um, and recognizing that they may not need uh, as much real estate um, office space uh, as they had previously as some other workforce can now work effectively at home. Um, and that commercial property may in fact be released uh, and made available to the residential uh, property market, which, which also may be might a welcome relief for, for that sector. So. Uh, that was it for me, guys. I hope that was uh, of interest. And uh, back to you, Karen. Thanks very much, Mike. That was great. So lastly, but not least, and hopefully on an increasingly positive note um, to, to put you in a good mood for the afternoon, um, I'm bringing Harry Goddard, CEO of Deloitte Ireland, who's going to briefly share some leadership insights amid this period of uncertainty. So Harry, I'll hand over to you. Uh, thank you, Karen, and also to Kieran and Mike for their insights and perspectives. We can see from Mike's analysis and measures to manage the health uh, threat are, in an Irish context, starting to pay dividends. However, we can also see from Mike and from Kieran's comments that the economic crisis is only beginning to reveal itself. Over the past three weeks, as we've responded to COVID-19, I found myself writing to the entire organization at Deloitte uh, a couple of times a week to share with them what's happening across our business and how we're responding to this crisis. I noted in one of the emails last week how quickly this crisis has unfolded by reference to various events that had taken place over the previous two months, beginning with a trip I had done to clients on the west coast of the US. 
right through to the Taoiseach's announcements three weeks ago, and our subsequent decamping for our buildings, which are now all closed, although we do, of course, remain uh, open for business. The level of uncertainty that this crisis creates is unprecedented in most of our, our lifetimes. Not only are there real threats to our health and our society, we've all had to adapt to very significant change in an incredibly short space of time. The crisis with existing trends, trends such as technology automation and in cybersecurity, it will create new trends in how we work and new privacy debates in what we are prepared to share and to track. And we've all seen in the media how various nations' leaders are responding to the crisis, from our own Taoiseach to our largest trading partners in the US and the UK, Prime Minister Orban in Hungary, and of course Xi Jinping in China. It will be like an MBA in leadership development uh, if it wasn't so serious. There's no doubt that the crisis will define businesses, organizations, and leaders, and I can see it myself across our client portfolio and across our businesses around the world. And I think in that context that there are five areas to consider when approaching this crisis as a leader, which ultimately I think will define uh, successful businesses and leaders of the future. The first is to ensure that decisions are taken which balance both the head and the heart. A Harvard Business Review undertook an assessment of core performance during the past three recessions and found that of the 4,700 firms studied, those that cut costs fastest and deepest had the lowest probability of outperforming competitors after the economy recovered. Balancing the needs of the business's financial performance with genuine empathy for employees and suppliers of the business requires a level of emotional intelligence and makes a real difference to the nature of the post-crisis organization. People will remember how their organization made them feel post this crisis. The second is to put the mission first. And perhaps to best bring this up, I spoke with the CFO of a global public company last week and their business. And I think he put it best. There is nothing else on our agenda, he said, except COVID-19. We have established our command center, developed our talent strategy, and taken the steps and put in place the controls to ensure financing and liquidity. I know this business well, and they have a playbook for the measures they will take to ensure the protection of the business, depending on the depth and length of the crisis, and the balance of financial and non-financial goals they will have for themselves. They've established a SWAT team to focus on the key customer portfolios, and they're engaged with their business ecosystem, driving any tactical, necessary digital capabilities. The third capability is to aim for speed over items. Perfect is the enemy of done. The situation created by this crisis is moving too quickly to wait for all of the data and to undertake all of the analysis. Most organizations don't have access to all of the data necessary in time in any event. In my own experience, this comes down to the strength, quality, and diversity of the leadership team in the organization. Over the course of the last three weeks, I've had 16 meetings with my leadership team designed to make the decisions necessary to navigate our way through this crisis. A diverse team that has shared trust, shared goals, and is prepared to have challenging but constructive discussions makes good decisions. I'm sure they aren't all perfect, but they got us to where we are so far, I think, in a pretty good place. The fourth is to own the narrative. And at a time when an organization and its people are going through such significant change at a personal and a professional level, they need leaders who will provide them with confidence and guidance. Communicating regularly, clearly, and transparently is incredibly important. There are no advantage to sugarcoating any messages. Clear, consistent communications that deals with the unknowns and the current realities, that provides context, insight, and confidence is incredibly important. And the lack of clear, regular, and consistent communication will create gaps that the organization will try and fill in for itself, often with worries and misinformation. A crisis such as this requires the whole organization to pull together to face it with the same information setting out on the same path with the same tools to overcome it. It requires a confidence and a mindset that's created through a strong narrative. The first four things that I have seen that really illustrate strong leadership in a crisis are to balance the heart and the head, to put the mission first, to aim for speed over elegance, and to own the narrative. The fifth is to embrace the long view. Resilient leaders are looking to the long term. This crisis will accelerate existing trends and create new ones. It's important to be clear about how those trends will influence the business, create huge opportunities, provide access to new markets or new ways of doing things. Trends that are obvious include end-to-end -end automation and digital, 
other trends will emerge in where we work, how we share our personal data, and how we think about uh, business continuity. I think one final comment I might make as I reflect on today's discussion and also the discussions I have had with leaders across the economy with regard to COVID-19 is that most leaders are optimistic that their business will navigate its way through this crisis, albeit some requiring significant government support, but few are optimistic that this will be over quickly. The longer this continues, the more comfortable we are with that fact. Generally speaking, businesses with operations in Asia saw this first and see it as lasting longer than businesses who don't. And I think in particular for us in Ireland, as Kieran has mentioned already, we are dependent on a number of external factors being such an open economy. However, we have been through this before. Our economy is only 100 years old and has developed from being an insular, agrarian island to one of the most globally connected and outward-looking economies in the world. Over the lifespan of our economy, we have demonstrated ourselves as courageous and entrepreneurial, and we will do so again, shining, so to speak, as the green dot in the global economy. Hopefully, Karen, bringing our uh, live stream to a slightly more positive outlook, I'll hand back to you for the uh, Q&A session. Excellent. Thanks very much, Harry. So I'll now invite our speakers for a short Q&A. We've had lots of questions through, um, probably won't get to them all, um, but um, we might try to answer some afterwards if we can. So, Kieran, I, I might start with the, the spotlight on you um, and, and just ask you and, and put you on the spot. Have you any ideas around how the government can kickstart the economy once the administrative closures are lifted? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's a hugely relevant question. Um, I think I think I mentioned this in my presentation that um, you know when we were initially framing our, our commentary uh, before COVID-19 had become the issue it, it was, we were focusing quite a bit on the housing market given um, obviously the, the huge emphasis on housing in the recent general election and notwithstanding the fact that housing is a huge issue and you know we, we do quite a lot of work on housing and we see the huge I suppose imbalance between supply and demand that is in the market over the last period of time. Um, and when we were framing our initial comments, we were talking about the dangers of the economy overheating if there was a substantial increase in the amount of, uh, of housing that was constructed. I think it's clear now that overheating is, is, is no longer an issue, and nor is it likely to be an issue for some time. So one way that the government could is to possibly um, commit itself to a fairly significant program of house building uh, in, in the short to medium term. And I think even making the announcement and committing to a certain number of units, for example, being built over uh, a period of time on a consistent basis, I think would give a certain degree of confidence to uh, the market, would reignite a, a large amount of investment activity, I think. Um, and it would also address a huge issue that is there. You know, There's no doubt that the lack of housing and the shortage of housing is a major, major issue in the economy, has been a major issue in the economy over the last number of years, uh, and one that ultimately needs to be addressed. So I think that's one area where the government could, um, um, if you like, uh, try and reignite economic activity. I think a lot depends, though, and why we focus quite a bit on the role of European players, is that clearly European institutions have a huge role to play in stabilizing the debt situation, stabilizing debt markets, so that governments can access debt markets um, to deal with the crisis, and that also that they won't be left with huge levels of debt after the crisis going forward, because that ultimately will impact uh, on economic activity. Yep, that, that makes absolute sense. Um, one other question that I, I find interesting that, that came through, Kieran, and, and um, that I, I don't know if you can comment on is, you know, the, the impact in the current crisis is probably slightly different to before in that it's not that all areas and all sectors have been hit equally. You do have some sectors that are performing as normal, but others which will be drastically hit. How do you think that will impact on, on the recovery and how the economy can, can pick itself up again? Yeah, I think it's a very relevant question. I think it's also very relevant if you think of it in terms of the government's response, and that's why we were at pains to point out, like a number of commentators have, that what's needed is a targeted response, that you provide the funding to the households on the one hand and the firms and businesses on the other that are most impacted. And there was some talk initially about 
you know, possibly issuing checks to everybody in the economy. But, you know, we quickly pointed out that that's not really doable in, 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 in the present context because of the administrative closure, but that t- targeted response is ultimately what's needed. I think it does um, it, it does kind of lend itself to the issue as to how the economy will recover in the sense that uh, I think a crucial dynamic in the recovery of the Irish economy uh, post the financial crisis was that we started essentially to go back to what we had been doing best at the uh, the, the initial phases of the Celtic Tiger, which was through trade. And if you look at one of the reasons why the economy picked up so strongly from 2011, 2012 onwards was because there was a recovery, you know, the, the United States, the UK recovered a little bit quicker than, for instance, the rest of Europe, uh, and our exports started to increase quite substantially during that period. So we essentially traded our way back out of the crisis that we had gotten into. So and I think that's going to be interesting in terms of certain elements of our uh, our export sectors. As I said in my presentation, there's some elements and sectors that won't be impacted by the crisis or will be impacted very on a very marginal basis by the crisis. But then there's going to obviously be other areas that are going to be substantially impacted and, and, and the areas that we all have, have discussed. And I think um, that's where, again, I think the response of a government is going to be important in terms of targeting measures that can kind of re-stimulate uh, uh, activity in those specific sectors of the economy. But for some, there's no doubt that this will signal, I think, a very significant change. There's no going back. I think there's no, you know, no going back to normal, if you like, for certain sectors that have been impacted. There will be significant and permanent changes that come about as a result of uh, what we're experiencing right now. Yep, absolutely. Um, Kieran, I might give you a break for the moment and maybe move to Harry with, with I suppose, a, a slightly different focus. Harry, you, you know, you'll have heard Mike say in his presentation around the impact potentially on commercial property, given we could be moving more towards remote working. Um, given your background in technology um, and thinking about when we return to what's going to be the new normal, what innovations do you see coming down um, the tracks? Um, so I, I, I think that we'll probably all find that actually we quite enjoy not having to face the morning and evening commute and um, while we will we'll want to get back to having much greater connectivity with, with uh, work colleagues and other people, uh, we will seek I think to find a, a better balance in how we use our time and where we spend it and consequently I think home working will form a much bigger part of, um, of, of our future environment. And I, I think home working won't just be working from home. I think it will also involve uh, the use of um, uh, various regional and local hubs to facilitate people getting access to perhaps a high quality office environment where they get out of the actual home and don't necessarily want to come into the office. I think the key thing isn't just that people can work from home, but that people don't need to work in the office. Um, I, I think the technology is probably all there, Karen, in terms of uh, innovations. And uh, I think where we'll probably see uh, most of the thinking being done now uh, and where we're likely to see innovations is how uh, organizations will develop and sustain their culture with their employees who don't spend time in the office. Um, we spend a lot of time, I think, as we have developed uh, office work workspaces in ensuring that the brand of the organization is clear, uh, that the values are presented uh, somewhere uh, probably within the building uh, to help them calculate uh, all of the workforce uh, into the culture of the organization. Um, whereas if people aren't coming to the office anymore, uh, a different approach will be required. And not just, I think, to ensure that people um, get a sense and become part of the culture of the organization, but also that, that they feel and remain connected and part of the organization. I think the, 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 the related trends to that, and what's why I think uh, only narrative and looking to the future is, is important, is um, despite the focus in, in this discussion, and I think in many boardrooms around the country, on uh, uh, managing the PNL and managing the bottom line. Uh, I think for organizations to be clear about their purpose and how they're going to contribute to and engage with their community, I think will be really important. And uh, I feel certain that that will be an important part of organizations' narratives as they, uh, as they look to the future. Excellent, thanks, Harry. Um, I, I think to be mindful of time, we might look at wrapping up. Um, I suppose to close, I, I do hope that everyone has found this useful. I want to thank all the speakers for their insights today. I think definitely well worth listening to. Um, 
I would ask if you have additional questions or would like to connect directly with any of our speakers today, you can use the contact information on the slide or equally connect with your usual Deloitte contacts. Um, I think in order for all of us to be successful as we move from the respond phase to recovery, it's critical that we take care of ourselves so we're well prepared for returning back to our, our new normal. So with that in mind, I hope you join me this weekend in spending time with family, whether virtually or remotely, relaxing, and most importantly, indulging in some nice Easter eggs. So thank you all. We'll finish now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.